Hey guys, this is Eden back for another video on using TensorFlow and implementing that into our neural network. So I'm super excited for this episode because we're finally going to finish this neural network and have our first full TensorFlow implementation. So before we jump into it, I actually want to go over something I think I kind of skipped over a little bit last time, which is right here. Uh, where is it? The biases. I didn't explain them there. Well, I explained them a little bit. I forgot to talk about what this parameter right here is. And this argument is just the size or the shape. So just like we have the shape up here, this is the shape for the bias. And when we think about a bias, I said we add a bias to every single node except for the nodes in our input layer. So that would mean we need one for every hidden node and one for every output node, right? And that's why the shape of these for our first biases, the shape is the amount of hidden nodes, and then we have the amount of output nodes. So just clarifying that, I don't think I clarified in the last video, wanted to make sure I got that. And now that we've got that, we can move on. And now we're gonna start working with actual our actual data. Last time we were working with actually building the TensorFlow model, but nothing, no data was flowing through it yet. So now I'm gonna go to a new cell here, and this is from two tutorials ago when we made our neural network from scratch. This right here is just separating our data into training and testing. So if you haven't seen that yet, I'm not gonna explain this because I explained it two videos ago or three. So go check that out if you're unsure about this, but it's just splitting up the data into training and testing. So the next thing we wanna do is, and really this is the last thing we need to do, is we need a trainer network and then test its accuracy and see how we've done. So this is very similar to what we did before except for we just have to use TensorFlow's mumbo jumbo whatnot. So first I'm gonna create a, a list for our losses. So this will just, we'll keep a history of what our losses so we can graph it at the end and see how we progressed and our display stride because we don't want to print out all the data or it would just be too much. We wanna have a little stride there. We wanna print out after maybe we've trained every 100 steps or something like that. That way we're not constantly just throwing throwing information out. It's more of like a, an update as opposed to a raw information dump. And then what we want to do is we want to say with TF session as session. And this is a really important part. And let's talk about a bit what a TF session is or a TensorFlow session. So when we create our model up here, like I said, there's no data running through it yet. When we create a session, however, this is kind of all brought to life. A session contains all like this model and everything, everything that comprises it. So we have to do everything that we want to do with this model through our session. So now everything under here, um, when we talk about sesh or ses session, whatever, it will refer to uh, the session that contains that model in the TensorFlow data. So the first thing we need to do is we actually need to initialize our variables. So up here, weights and biases, even though they're TF, this is all zeros and this is a random normal, well, they don't actually have values yet. Cause like I said, TensorFlow doesn't just go down the line and execute everything. You have to tell it what you wanna execute. This is just a layout, not an actual, like doesn't say, okay, let's run this, then this, then this. We tell it what we run and want, what we run and want, what we want to run. And the first thing we wanna run is the initialization of our variables. Uh, and to do that, we say sesh.run TF Dot global variables initializer and that will initialize all of our variables so the next thing we want to do is we'll actually start the training process so we will want to go here and we'll say correct equals zero and this will keep track of how many we have correct for the accuracy for purposes of the accuracy so the next thing we're going to want to do is we're, we are going to want to create a loop for first our epics and then we're also going to want a loop for our actual data. So for every data point in test X. And once we've got that, what we wanna do is actually run our model. And the way we do this in TensorFlow is a little bit interesting, right? So it's this session.run right here. This is what actually runs our model. So let's talk a bit about this because this, this can get kind of confusing if you don't understand it, but if you do understand it, it's super easy. So it, this takes two really, really important arguments and more, but two really fundamental ones. And what those are is I'm just 
everything that I'm going to write right now is not actually for the program. It's just an example. And what it is is we say call sesh dot run. We need first what we want to run in our model. So like I said, we tell TensorFlow what we want to run. If we want to run just up to layer two, we can say that. And to do that, I would just say run layer two. And this will just calculate our hidden layer. We can do that. Um, and let's say we want to calculate our hidden layer. Well, what would we need to do that? Well, the calculator hidden layer, let's see, uh, we need X, right? And X is a placeholder. And placeholders, we need to tell TensorFlow what those are. So if we are trying to get this, we need to pass in something called the feed dictionary. So feed dic equals, and it's just a dictionary. And we would say X colon. So the value of X in this case is going to be test X. And we're going to take I from that, right? So it's just going to be a value from I from, it's going to be a value from our test data points. And that's what X will be. So now what this will do is not only will it run this, right? It will run everything up to layer two. This function run will also return whatever the first argument is. So it will return layer two. So we could say L2 equals this, and then we could print out L2 and it would actually give us some value. So what we want to do is we want to do, or at least run three things. We want to run, first of all, the cost, right? And the reason we want to run the cost is um, one, we need it to find our, how to adjust our weights and whatnot. But more importantly, we just want to print it out and see where we are, like see how our model is doing. The next thing you want is the accuracy, which is another measure of how our model is doing. And then lastly, we want the optimizer. And the optimizer, we don't actually care what this returns, right? What we care about is just that we run through our network and the optimizer actually changes the weights for us and does gradient descent and it does all of that. And that's why we run that. So you can see I put all of these in as a list in brackets because this is one argument. So we want everything, all of our targets here in brackets separated by commas. And then it returns a tuple of everything in that first argument position. So it returns the loss, the accuracy, and then underscore, this is the optimizer. Again, we don't actually care what the optimizer returns because we just want to have them. We don't care what it gives back to us. And so I put an underscore there. And then what we do is we give it the feed dict. Well, here we want data X I. So this is just from our data X and oh, wow, this is actually wrong. My bad. We actually want train X and train Y. Otherwise, we'd be going from our entire data, not just our training data. We just want our training data. So our X will be one value from our training data, and Y will be one value from our Y training data. And then I reshape it just to make sure that it's in the right format. Because when up here we say that the shape is none and then in in. Well, none and negative one are the same thing when we are talking about shape. So if I reshape to negative one in in, I'm just making sure that this is in the right format uh, when we pass it in. And then to keep track of the accuracy over all these runs, I'm going to add this accuracy to correct. And when we print it out, we'll average it out over all these runs. So that's how the run works. Next, we want to actually print out our accuracy. So let's see, is that in the right place? Yes, it is. So every display stride, so every 10 runs of this, we will actually calculate our accuracy, which is just the amount we have correct divided by the amount of examples we've run through and print out the loss and the accuracy. And then we can also, every five runs, append a, our loss to our list of losses. And that way, at the very end of this, we can go ahead and print that out. And not print it out, but graph it. And to finally finish this up, we just want to, at the very end of everything, print out our accuracy. And to print out our accuracy, say final accuracy, and it's actually equal to, remember, we to get the accuracy, we actually have to run the model. We want to run it over all of our test data. So right here, what we do is we say, run the accuracy, that's what we want. And we're passing in our test X data and our test Y data. So that's all we should need. I'm gonna go ahead and run this, and then we will see, hopefully it works, and hopefully there's no errors. I'll be right back as soon as it's done. 
Okay, so that finished up and we can see this looks pretty good, right? Accuracy is pretty high, 100% here in the loss drops, but our final accuracy here is a little bit lower. And another thing is that this took a really long time for me to run. And by really long time, I mean like, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 plus seconds. But when you're running something of this size, it really should be super fast. And by super fast, I mean finish in a couple of seconds. If you're running on your GPU, um, I'd really recommend getting the GPU version of TensorFlow if you have a GPU that works. If you're on a CPU, by the way, this will take a lot longer. But one thing we can do for a GPU is we can actually, because right now what we're doing is when we come down here, we are sending a training batch of one example at a time, right? Train X at I, that's one example. Train Y at I, that's one example. And we can really speed this up by sending multiple, uh, multiple examples at once or multiple using a batch. And the reason this is much faster is although GPU matrix multiplication is insanely fast, it takes a long time to actually send that information to your GPU. So instead of having to send, because what do we have like about 600 examples, instead of sending 600 individually, it'd be much faster if we sent maybe 50 at a time. Then we only have to send maybe about eight, what is that way, what, I don't even remember what I just said, 12 loads. Then we only have to send 12 loads instead of 600. Much better, right? So if we come back up here, that's why I had this batch size earlier. So we're gonna send 64 examples at once and hopefully that will speed up our model. So the way we're gonna to wanna to do that is first we're gonna come up here and we're gonna say num batches. So the number of batches we're gonna run is going to be the length of our entire training data set divided divided by our batch size. So this will get the amount of batches and the divided, the two divided just means we'll truncate it. That way we don't go and have an extra batch when we have nothing there. Right, um, we don't want like half a batch that doesn't really make sense, or we don't want to run a loop for three and a half times, right? That doesn't make sense. So then when we come down here to our for loop, what we wanna do is instead of what we have now, instead of length of test X, we want to do the number of batches. We'll loop for the number of batches. And then we'll do, create two new things. The first is the lower bound and then the upper bound. So the lower bound is gonna be where we start. So if we have 500 maybe training samples, which sample we start at, and then the upper bound is which sample we end at in terms of what we're sending to the GPU. So the first thing we wanna send is I times number of batches. So I is gonna be zero, then one, then two, and so on. And number of batches is gonna be a constant, what is it? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, is this correct? No, this should be batch size, my bad batch size. Let me fix this up real quick and then we'll be right back. Great, so all I did right here is I just changed these both to batch size. So we'll start at zero times something, so zero, and then we'll start at 64, and then we'll start at 128, and so on. And our upper bound each time will be i plus one times batch size, so one amount of batches above where we started, except for in the case that let's say we have maybe 498 test examples, right? And we're going up in batches of 50. So that means our last batch will be from 450 to 500. However, we don't have a 499 and we don't have a 500th example or sample. So what we wanna do is in, in that case, instead of having going from 450 to 500, we would go from 450 to 498. And that's what this will do. The minimum of either the length of all our samples or up to the batch size. And then what we can do is if we come right down here, we can change our feed dictionary to be a little bit like this. So we'll do train X from the lower bound to the upper bound and train Y from the lower bound to the upper bound. So now, if we go ahead and do this, and oh my gosh, I just noticed a terrible example, not terrible example, a terrible issue. Glad I caught this. Our um, accuracy was wrong. This is the length of test X. Really, this should have been the length of train X anyway. Now it's gonna be changed to, instead of that, now it's gonna be the number of batches. 
because yeah that makes sense and then what we want to do this was test x this really needs to be train x right because our upper bound should not go up to the amount of testing samples but to the amount of training samples um that was that was an annoying issue to solve because it kept crashing my kernel for some reason so now if we actually run this we should see that this goes much faster there we go look at that that's like at least 10 20 times faster than it was last time got an accuracy of 96 so that's pretty awesome we finished implementing our first neural network with tensorflow you should be very proud this is not an easy task to do but we got through it and we definitely made something awesome so i hope you guys enjoyed this series of using tensorflow the next thing i would like to do is show you guys how to use something like tf learn a little higher level api that way we can make things even simpler and then start on some projects so i'm still trying to decide on what direction i want to go in terms of projects whether or not to make a go bot a starcraft 2 bot or teach things like reinforcement learning there's a lot of different things i'd like to do so definitely comment below what you'd like to see coming up in the future and also if this video helped you definitely please leave a like and subscribe to the channel to keep up with more videos thank you very much and i'll see you guys next time